views expressed on this program are those of the hosts, guests, and callers, and are not necessarily those of this station, its management, or other advertisers. You're listening to Transformation Talk Radio. Listening to the Psychic Professors Show, the Voices of Spirit Radio, with international medium and spirit artist Dr. Susan Barnes. This hit call in show will answer any questions you have about spiritual communication through on air readings and spirit artistry. Get ready to receive breakthrough wisdom to enliven and enlighten your life. To say this show is educational is an understatement. Dr. Susan is the medium through which spirit communication occurs and fills the canvas of your life. Everyone, I'm Dr. Susan Barnes, and you are listening to the Psychic Professor Show on Transformation Talk Radio. And for the next hour, we will be bringing you spiritual voices to try to answer your questions or provide you with some new thinking and information about how we can communicate with spirit. Our topic today is music and spirit, and I have a very special guest, Marjorie Roth. Dr. Marjorie Roth is with us today. Welcome, Marjorie. Thank you, Sue. Um, Why don't you start by telling us a little bit about your background with music? Well, um, my background with music goes back all the way, I think, to before I was born. I, my mom sang all the time while I was coming into being, and I think I was born attuned to music and grew up in a really musical family. And after a childhood that was spent studying music in different ways, now I'm a professor of music, um, music performance, and also music history, which is really uh, a nice thing for me to be able to combine those two things. So I, t- I teach at Nazareth College and uh, have some very, very interesting music students there. That sounds wonderful. How, uh, tell us a little bit about Nazareth. Where is it? It's up here in Rochester, New York. And it's kind of a unique uh, music department in that we have the traditional things that you usually study when you study the performance of music. So there's music history, music theory, and music performance. And now we have music composition, which is also very good for us. Um, But in addition to that, we have professional programs in music business, music therapy, and music education. And so as as a studio flute teacher and a music history teacher, I get to work with all of those students, and I learn from them a lot about how they process music and what it means to them and what sort of things it does for them, sort of physically and emotionally and intellectually. And it's very different, you know, depending on the the area of music the student has decided to go into. Mm. That's really interesting. And um, so you've been doing, see, I'm not musical. That's what I have to say. I mean, I tried. I tried to play the guitar when I was a kid, and that lasted a little while. But my mother tried to teach me piano, and that didn't work. Um, so I really, I really respect people who are musical and I really feel that you have an advantage because you can really use uh, music to help get in touch with things spiritually as well. And, um, so why don't we start with talking about what have you started to find about the relationship between music and spirit? Well, I think anybody who is a musician and any any of your listeners who are out there, if you've played music by yourself or especially if you have played music with other people, you notice right away that it opens up a channel of communication that does not involve words. I mean, in my case, I'm a flutist, and so I have an instrument stuck to my face, and I really can't talk when I'm working with a pianist or other people in a small ensemble So you find after a while that sometimes it's body language, sometimes it's facial expressions when you're playing that conveys your ideas or your communication to other people. But sometimes there's there's just something else that happens between musicians that are playing together that allows them 
to stay together as a unit. It's really magical. It's a magical kind of experience. And although we have all sorts of technical explanations for how we do that, and we study that a lot, um, that's a it's a very special kind of feeling that you get. And that opens the door then, I think, for any musician to contemplating other ways that music channels things for us. You know, things that channel through us into our listeners, out to our listeners, and things that channel into us as we're experiencing music, or in the case of a composer, uh, creating music. Yes, well, I've known um, several people that um, will do go to spiritualist churches and just improvise and play music, and it's like just happening at that moment. Yes, they didn't write it in advance. Yeah. Yes, improvisation is a skill. I think that of course everybody has to learn improvisation. And my music therapy students have a very interesting class up here called clinical improvisation, where essentially they're doing healing when they're doing their work. And they get a job and they're out doing their clinical work. They're healing people through music, and so they need to have all the techniques of music right at their finger fingertips, so that they don't break whatever whatever healing, I hate to use the word ritual, I think my colleagues might freak out a little bit if they heard me use ritual. But to me, a lot of the things that they're doing seem sort of ritualistic, repetition, to get that, get that music going, get that energy building. And I have also read, I mean, I, I am not a practicing spiritualist myself, but I've read a lot about um, exactly what you said, that in some spiritual churches and also in some circles, people will use music to sort of get the vibration going and keep the vibration high while the re while the activity is going on. So well, that's, does yeah, that. that's absolutely true. I mean, we know that certain types of music um, will help to build the vibration. And sometimes it's the fast, crazy music that spirit wants to hear rather than the slow meditative stuff. I mean, people like to put on music when they're doing meditation, but in the seance room, it is a little bit different. And lots of times what we do is we get everybody to sing like row, row, row your boat so that we will just get the group in sync with each other. That's, I think that you just put your finger on that in sync thing. Um, is music has a has a, a an ability to get people moving together, and you can extend that out into just about every way you want to. I mean, what you just said, it gets you sort of in sync rhythmically and emotionally and vibrationally. But if you want to extend that idea out, you can think of music as a force that can also get people to act in a coordinated manner politically or socially or in much larger context than what we're just talking about in terms of the small musical ensemble or the little classroom. Hmm. That's really interesting. I guess I've never really thought about music in this way, and I haven't thought about... Now, now do they have music therapy? At Nazareth? Courses? Well, I don't know if there are courses. Is there such a thing? Oh, as a, yes, music therapy, there is, it is such a thing. It is one of our larger degree programs here. And uh, I, I noticed that I teach a course here on music and magic that isn't like magic in terms of magical tricks and things like that, but it's sort of magic as a healing force. And we go back a lot into antiquity and look at the way the Greeks and other ancient cultures used music. And I find the students who are the most receptive to those ideas and the, the kids who just get it right away are the ones who are studying to be music therapists. And those kids will go out and work eventually in hospitals or private practices or any place, you know, where there is a developmental issue or a physical issue. And it really is amazing talking to them sometimes about the, the things they have observed music to do with a person who ha is maybe suffering from aphasia or kids who have um, se severely developmentally disabled kids, the things they're able to do once rhythm gets going for them or melody gets going for them. It's really quite moving. Yes. I mean, I guess the one area where I've been aware of it is with autism. Ah, ah yes. We actually, we, I think we have an autism clinic here uh, at, at Nazareth. So there's a, there's a specialty going up here with that. Yeah. Because I know that, that some people with autism, they've used music as a way for them to communicate and start to, to re relate to other people. 
Right. So I think, this, you know, one of the things that I've observed in terms of my little looking around in this area of channeled music is it, it kind of falls into two, two different categories. One of them is sort of what we think of as the more traditional channeled music, where the person that is that the music is coming to is behaving very much like a medium, like a spiritualist medium. They are the vessel into which music is coming from somewhere else, and then it's going out through them. Just like a spiritualist, I guess, would bring messages from spirit to people. It just uh -huh. a person doing channeled music does the same thing. They just do it with music. And then you can sort of reverse that process and think of music as a channel. So music is a channel to bring us to a slightly higher level, uh, to bring us back to a kind of higher spiritual music or music of the spheres. And I kind of started getting into this idea when I was reading a little bit of Edgar Cayce lately, just lately. And well, he has fascinating things to say about this. Well, you know what? I think I'd like to talk to you a little more about the difference between the channel music and using the music to get you into higher vibration. Okay. However, we're about to go on a break. Okay. So we'll be back. You're listening to the Psychic Professor Show with Dr. Susan Barnes on Transformation Talk Radio. Be back soon. Now you can be a part of one of the most powerful programs to help create a more joyful, loving, abundant, and peaceful world. Every day at 12 noon in any time zone, join millions of other people around the world to spend a few minutes in joy, love, and gratitude. Brought to you by Robert Schoenfeld, host of the Art of Powerful Living Radio. Together, we can raise the vibration of the planet. For more information, visit globalmomentofjoy.com. Have you ever said to a friend, I am trying to be less stressed, I am hoping to meet someone special, or how about I am working on getting a job I love? Hi, I'm Eve from Elite Tarot, host of the weekly show, Mainstream Metaphysics Radio. Words like hoping, wanting, and trying may seem innocent, however they carry with them emotional weight that actually blocks energy. Next time you start to say these words, say instead, I am becoming less stressed. I am looking forward to meeting someone special. I am pursuing a job I love. While your brain may resist, note how your body physically feels as possibility of success suddenly appears. As an intuitive coach and professional tarot card reader, I work with clients worldwide on using energy effectively to embrace joy. If you'd like to schedule a session, please visit my website at EliteTarot.com. That's E-L-I-T-E-T-A-R-O-T dot -E com. Awareness is universal. Establishing a living awareness through meditation brings peaceful, healthy, and creative well-being into your everyday life. The practice of living awareness, Spirit Fire's own meditation practice, is built on this belief and is designed for every level of practitioner. Each year, Spirit Fire hosts living awareness meditation retreats that allow you to explore the practice in depth at our retreat center in beautiful western Massachusetts. Introduce yourself to meditation and the practice at the Foundations Retreat. Attend, in silence, a silent meditation retreat focused on mindfulness, presence, and nature. Or be engaged with the meditation sittings themselves at the Deepening Retreat. Start adding to your awareness and attend a meditation retreat designed to cultivate consciousness in your everyday life. For details on attending a Living Awareness Meditation Retreat, visit upcoming events at www.spiritfire.com. Tune into the wisdom of your soul for guidance on living a joyful life. On Soul Wisdom Radio, Wendy will provide inspiration to raise your vibration and connect with your higher self and guides. Learn how to balance your ego and to progress spiritually on Soul Wisdom Radio with Wendy Rose Williams. Visit wendyrosewilliams.com or Transformation Talk Radio to learn more about a healing session with Wendy and her events and publications. And we're back on the Psychic Professor Show with Dr. Susan Barnes. And the lines are open if you have any questions 
about spirit and music or mediumship and music. And our number is 1-800-930-2819. 1-800-930-2819. And again, we are now talking to Marjorie Roth, and we were talking about um, the way music can be either channeled through a medium or used um, for inspirational purposes. Do you have more to say on that, Marjorie? Yes, I do. So I think maybe the it, maybe the most interesting thing to start with would be the channeled music part, the start that is coming in from somewhere else. And I have a couple things to say about that. Um, I think I first got interested in this idea when I started, I was actually studying Sibylline prophecy as a graduate student. And I used to do a lot of gigs at that time. I played with a guitarist and in the car one day when we were driving around and I was trying to explain to her what a Sibyl was in the ancient world, that it was a woman who would go into a sort of trance and she would hear the voice of the God and then she would give a message out to whoever was listening. My The woman that I played with, the guitarist that I worked with said to me, oh, you know, you should go to Lilydale. They have people at Lilydale who do do that kind of thing. And so that was my first introduction, just even to the idea of opening up the mind or the soul or the spirit or whatever to a certain kind of contact. And since I started coming to Lilydale and I've learned more about spiritualism, then I got interested in this channeled music thing. And I think I've noticed a, a couple of different ways people describe music that is channeled through them. Some people, mostly performers, will say, that in the middle of a performance, they will notice that some part of their body seems to be taken over by something that is not them. Um, I think the most interesting guy I read was someone who says that his hands, when he plays guitar solos, are taken over by Jimi Hendrix. And he knows that he is one with Jimi Hendrix at that time because he could never, he knows when that feeling is gone, and then he knows that he could never have played that solo himself. It had to have been someone else's hands. So I've read about several people who feel that either their voice or their hands on the, on the piano or the guitar or something is actually taken over by someone else and that they are being used as the vehicle for that person then to express, that departed person to express through them. And then also there are people like um, Mrs. Rosemary Brown. I'm, I'm sure some of your listeners have heard of her before. Um, in the 1960s, she made quite a splash by coming out and telling people that the composer, Franz Liszt, the 19th century composer Franz Liszt, and several other very prominent composers from the 19th century and the 20th century, and even before that, visited her and sat with her and spoke to her and wrote music through her. Um, and it's interesting, it's interesting piano music. It's not exactly what one would expect Liszt to have written or Schumann to have listened, but it's close, it's in the ballpark. And I have a student right now actually who's learning some of these piano pieces for my music and magic class. And we're all going to listen to them at the end of the semester and compare them to some other pieces that we know for certain are by Franz Liszt. But Mrs. Brown had a very interesting experience from, from childhood. She said she was visited by Liszt and he told her that when she was an adult, he would bring her music. And that the reason he was bringing her music and all his other composer friends were bringing her music were, was to prove to the world that life continues afterwards. That was their whole goal. It wasn't to continue their careers as composers, but instead to give people hope and prove to them that life does continue. That's interesting. And, and Liszt wasn't a spiritualist. I mean, I've never heard him be no, identified no. as one. No, no, Liszt yeah. was... Yeah, List, List actually became a Catholic priest at the end of his life after quite a, a adventurous and active youth where he was anything but priest-like. Um, he did, he did uh, settle down in his, in his older years. Um, some of the other composers that Mrs. Brown said visited her included both Robert and Clara Schumann, um, Franz Schubert. She had a very nice description of Franz Schubert's energy. Um, she said Beethoven was a little hard to work with, which I, I don't think would surprise anyone who ever knew Beethoven. Um, and J.S. Bach was very austere, and she had a little bit of a hard time with him. Uh, Chopin, I think, was another one. And Rachmaninoff actually criticized her piano skills and said she'd be better 
at getting their message across if she could play the piano better. So she apparently took some piano lessons from him also. Now for musicians, this is, I mean, when we hear this, we think, oh my goodness, you know, these are, these are our heroes. These are some of the icons of music history. And certainly for pianists, these are some of the most important composers. So it's a little bit strange sometimes when I tell my students about this, they all look very surprised and very skeptical. But then I have them read about Mrs. Brown and she, she was quite a sincere woman. And I'm, I am convinced that she was convinced that this is what she was doing and that those composers were with her all the time. Yes, um, I can see why your students might be a little bit skeptical. Um, but what's interesting is that um, the composer would come back and say that he's trying to prove the continuity of life because that is one of the spiritualist principles. That's why I was asking. But you know what? Many things that are spiritual are in many, many different religions. Okay, we were talking about channeled music. Now, what about inspirational music? Well, I'm not sure. I mean, I think inspirational music exists in every religion. So that's kind of a, or, or even outside of religion, anything that is inspirational. I, I would have to narrow this down a little bit to my own particular take on this. Um, in my own academic study, I've spent a lot of time with Neoplatonist ideas. And my understanding of inspirational anything is a sound or a smell, or a taste, or anything that we do down here in our material form that creates in the soul a memory of something that we remembered, that the soul remembered when it existed at a different level, on a different plane. And so for me, inspirational music, according to those Neoplatonic ideas, is any kind of music that reminds us of what I guess we would call the harmony of the spheres, or has been by other people called the harmony of the spheres or the harmony of the cosmos. So it's a kind of musical sound that activates a memory in the soul. And even though our human bodies can't go back up to those higher spheres, our souls can go up there. So they sort of follow the music back, and we are in some, in some way comforted by that even though our body, we're stuck down here in our bodies, but our soul remembers that original memory goes back there, and that is a comforting thing for us or a spiritually uplifting thing for us. Okay, now, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's m many different types of music that people do find inspirational. Let me ask you, are there any recordings of these channeled music things? I mean, I have, um, we did, we were lucky, we did have a uh, pianist come and play a little bit of Rosemary Brown's work this summer at Lilydale. Um, but are there recordings of it? Where yes, can people it find it? That was charming. Um, I think there are some recordings online. If you get on YouTube, really, there are some recordings there. And there's a very interesting video on Rosemary Brown. And in that video, you'll hear her playing a little bit of the music. And you'll hear other people playing some, some of the music. Some of the pieces that she wrote were actually too difficult for her, that she wrote down, I should say that she copied down at the instruction of the other composers were a little hard for her to play. So you can hear recordings of other people playing them. Um, I did find a few other things outside of Mrs. Brown. There's a very interesting young woman named Susan Elsa, and she believes very much that she has a spiritual connection with uh, Michael Jackson. And she wrote a, a composition called One Love 777. And she claims that this was composed directly into the microphone. So no pen, no paper. In five minutes, it just came to her. She sang and recorded it right there. And it was released, it was came to her on her birthday. And for her, it was, a, it was clearly a gift from Michael to her. And that, I believe, has been recorded. Um, and there's another interesting gentleman. Let's see if I can find him. His name is Paul Armitage. And he channels music from the constellation Andromeda. That's what he believes, that his music is coming in from a constellation with a specifically healing and purifying uh, it, it, intention for human beings. And the whole goal of that music is to make a closer alignment of the soul with the beyond. So there's lots of different ways you can do this. I mean, spiritual music that is designed to lift you up, spiritual music that is designed to heal you, spiritual music that is a gift 
from someone to someone else specifically. It all seems quite um, personal. Yes, um, that's really interesting. And I just had to, to note that when you were talking about uh, Jimi Hendrix and the musician saying that he felt Jimi Hendrix was taking over his hands, that's what happens um, with uh, the art too, with spirit art. Um, yeah, they come through and, and, and people feel like their, their hands moving, but they're not doing it. So it's, um, it's really interesting that, that the, the two are very similar. Now, I guess the question would be, one of the questions um, that I was asked this summer was, can people play music um, if they're influenced by spirit, but not play it when they're not? Oh, say it one more time. We might, can people, all right. Is it possible for someone to like play the piano under the influence of spirit, but not be able to play in their normal life? Hmm. Well, what a question. I think, you know, I think, well, Mrs. Brown certainly could play the piano under the influence of spirit, play it well. And the fellow who believes he channels Jimi Hendrix definitely could play it well. And they both reported that when spirit was not inhabiting their hands, they did not play that well at all. I haven't heard of whether anybody who doesn't play an instrument at all can be possessed by spirit. And then I don't know if that's the right term, but have their hands possessed by spirit and suddenly be able to play something. I haven't heard of that, but maybe somebody in your listening audience has. Yes. And that's a good reminder that um, the lines are open, and if you're listening and would like to ask us a question, the phone number is 1-800-930-2819. And we're ready to take calls if you want to call in. Um, just to note, this program is sponsored by the Spirit Art Gallery at www.spiritartgallery.com. Net. And we're about to go on to another break, and we'll be back in a few more minutes with music and spirit. Transformation Talk Radio is dedicated to the education and awareness of Lyme disease. Welcome to Lyme Talk Radio. I'm Dr. Pat Vasily, the host of the Dr. Pat Show, and I am so thrilled that we've created this venue for all of you out there. Dr. Pat Vasily will be bringing the most innovative, groundbreaking information, research, treatment innovations, and stories from those it affects every day. What we have heard is that you want to ensure for us that we keep positive, holistic, uplifting, transformative talk radio on the air. We're excited to bring you the contemporary conversations about Lyme disease. We promise not to let the light fade on Lyme. So fasten your seat belts. We've got lots more to share with you in the weeks to come. Tune into Lyme Talk Radio with Dr. Pat and help keep our mission strong on TransformationTalkRadio.com. Hi there, this is Audrey Michelle, host of Rewired Life Radio. If you've listened to the show, you know I talk a lot about listening to your body. Here's the deal. Listening to your body takes quieting your mind, and I want to teach you how. Actually, we're going to start right now. Take a deep breath, a truly deep breath, all the way to the top of your inhale, and then exhaling to the very bottom of your belly, breathing feeding your body the oxygen and fuel it needs. This is the first step in listening to your body. There's more, but it's so easy. I want to share a quick meditation with you to help you instantly reconnect with yourself and listen to your body. Simply go to AudreyMichelle.com slash tips and download it for free today. That's Audrey Michelle spelled M-I-C-H-E-L dot com slash tips. Are you feeling stagnant or blocked in your love life, career, health, or finances? Experiencing difficulty focusing or setting and achieving goals? 
Tune in to Spiritual Diagnostics Radio with psychic visionary healers Carol Dorian and Justice Welling. Discover the cause and effect of unwanted patterns in life. Tune in every Tuesday at 12 p.m. Pacific on Transformation Talk Radio. For more information, visit spiritualdeed.com. Tune in each month to Synergenetic Living Radio, where Rick and Grace Paris discuss the synergenetic way of life, what it means to truly change your perspective in life, what it means to take control of your life and manifest your true desires. For more information on Rick and Grace Paris and Synergenetic Living, check out synergeneticliving.com. Get clear on the life you desire and the current life you are creating and what is between the two. Synergenetic Living, living life loud. We're back on the Psychic Professor Show with Dr. Susan Barnes, and our lines are open. So if you'd like to ask us a question about music and spirit, the number is 1-800-930-2819. And my guest is Marjorie Roth, and we've been having a very interesting discussion about whether or not someone can play music under the influence, it's not possession, it's influence, influence of spirit um, versus when they're not. Marjorie? Yes, and I, I think um, this reminds me of some things actually, that almost everything reminds me of work I do with my students and also my own experience. I know as a musician, I don't perform a lot, but occasionally I do, and occasionally I give recitals. I have in the past, and Every once in a while, I've had the experience of completely losing myself and playing way better than I thought I ever could have played. And the way I say that to myself when I get off stage is to say, wow, I really managed somehow to get out of my own way, to sort of step out of myself and feel open to something else. Now, I would never say that in my own experience, I could honestly say that I felt that I was under the influence of something I could identify, but I did at least notice a difference in the quality of my being when I was out of my own way. And I've noticed that many mediums that I've heard say that the very first thing you have to do is sort of be step aside so that something else can come to the fore. And I hear that a lot in musician friends of mine. Uh, performers and composers. I I have a very good composer friend here at work who says the same thing. He said, I just move out of the way. I set myself aside and then I just listen and the music comes in. So I guess my question to you, Sue, would be those of us who really, we are not spiritualists or we've never had a very clear experience of something else coming in to us that we could identify as other. Where does that How does that sound to you, to someone who has had this kind of experience? Is it just that we're not listening or we're unaware of what may be happening to us? Or are we just not having that kind of experience? No, I think that what a lot of it has to do is is that a lot of people just don't know the terminology and the philosophy of spiritualism. Because what you're saying to me basically is that when you do get out of the way, which is what the medium has to do, the medium gets out of the way and that allows the spirit to come through. And in this case, you get out of the way, the spirit can come through and bring you the music. So it's like with me, when I get out of the way, I hear a voice telling me things and usually I just repeat it. And so that's what they're doing, the same thing. They're hearing the music and then I'm sure they're writing it down or making a notation of it. So it's a very similar process, process is mediumship. Hmm. Hmm. Yes. I'm yeah. And I, yeah. Sure, go ahead. And I would also say that part of it is almost a trance like thing. And I use the word trance because, uh, trance is with spirit where channel channelers, um, can be from other types of entities like aliens and people from Atlantis and all kinds of stuff. But when you're bringing through um, a spirit, and it doesn't always have to be an identified like composer, like I'm bringing through the spirit of Beethoven or whatever, um, 
but it can just be a spirit coming through with the music, with the sounds um, that the person's healing. And they go into like a semi-state of trance where they may be aware of themselves, but they may be giving over to spirit so that the spirit can use their voice or use their hands. Does that make sense? Well, it really, you know, it sounds very familiar. It sound to me, this, what you're describing sounds like almost exactly the same words of the very fine performers that I've gone to school with or that I work with here at Nazareth. When they're really on, you know, anyone who is in an on mode feels as though they've sort of raised up and become one with something and they've dissolved into the music that they're performing. So it's I, this is very interesting for me to hear you use those words. And I've heard people use those words all my life, yet outside of the context outside of any context where they would have thought, given consideration to the fact that they were actually, actually merging with something else. Yes, they're going into an altered state. Yeah, altered states, I think most musicians, we walk around most of the time in altered states. <laughs> but this is a very specific kind of thing. I do know, I'm just, I have the quote here from um, my colleague up here at Nazareth that teaches composition. He was kind enough in his first year up here to, um, answer some very detailed questions I had for him after I'd been studying Mrs. Brown. I'd been studying her and her works and some of the critiques of her that have come in over the years, which have not always been, I thought, very kind or very open-minded. And he says here on this issue of whether something is coming in or not, he says, what some people call being helped by higher spirits, I usually call not being there or getting oneself out of the way. And for me, that was almost word for word what I had heard a medium say the summer before uh, in terms of how one trains as a medium. You're exactly right. We always say that. <laughs> we always say that. I'm always, to, you know, uh, I mean, and that's the hardest part because the hardest part for a medium is being able to turn off the internal chatter that goes on in your mind and putting that all aside and just letting spirit come through. Putting it, taking aside the internal chatter. Yeah, you know, it's like, you know, we always have like things, oh, I should have done that. You're, in your mind, you've got the chatter going on. I did this or I did that. Or the other thing that happens, and this is why most people don't do as well in, in, in mediumship as they should. The spirit comes in, they give them an image, like, um, what was the image we just got? Uh, they give us an image, I use the bicycle, they give us an image of a bicycle and automatically your mind wants to say, oh, someone's riding the bicycle. Oh, you know, the bicycle's this, the bicycle's that. And really all they want you to say is bicycle because when you add the other stuff, the recipient's not going to understand it. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's it's like amazing how many times that happens. And I always catch, I catch my students, my mediumship students with that all the time because I'll say, okay, did you add this? Or I'll actually catch them adding things on. And you can't, but I mean, I know our minds want to make stories, but we can't go there. We just have to open up and let the information flow. Um, from the spirit. Now, it might be a little easier to let music flow. Oh, this is very interesting. I uh, it, One of the things that Mrs. Brown uh, is always was always asked when she was alive, and she asked, actually, she said to Franz Liszt, why me? Why would you pick me when I'm not a great pianist? And I'm really, I have not been trained in composition. I mean, people who understand music knows that sometimes she would write a sharp when she was really actually supposed to write a flat. You know, it's C sharp, but she wrote D flat because she really didn't know even enough music theory to know what key she was in. So she said, why would you choose me, someone with insufficient te technique on the piano and almost no technical training as a composer or in music theory, why would I do it? Um, and she, he said to her, uh, let's see if I can find this quote. He said to her, your, had, we, had you been a trained composer, your own ideas would have gotten in the way and it would have slowed the process down. So he said almost exactly what you just said 
allegedly when Franz Liszt spoke to her, he said exactly what you said. She would have too much clutter in her own mind and too many of her own ideas and her own designs about the piece of music so that their ideas would not have been able to come through clearly. And that was one of the questions that I asked my composer friend, of course, because he has had a lot of training and a lot of experience, and yet he says the same thing. You know, his idea is you must clear the mind and let the music come in. And his idea here is he says, it's tricky sometimes to listen in stillness. The part that writes wants to analyze rhythm, time, key signatures, etc., and analysis gets in the way. So it must be kept to a bare minimum, just enough so that a memory is created while listening in stillness, and then the magic can be brought back from the adventure. So his response to that seems to be that that when he creates music, he think I, I am not saying that he is channeling, and he would never say that he was channeling. He says that he's listening. And when he's in that state of listening, he feels that he needs to keep that clutter, the clutter of his training, out of the way a little bit so that he can then just remember that melody and then use his technique to get it down, to get it written down. Which is, I think, it's very different from Mrs. Brown in terms of the way they describe it. But for me, the outsider, it sounds remarkably the same. Well, I think there are some similarities. I think, well, the way we would explain it as mediums is we would say that spirit works with everybody differently. So um, the way they worked with, with Mrs. Brown would be different than the way they work with the, your composer friend. Um, but it's still a very similar type of process because once you start thinking about things um, on a linear logical level, you kill it. It's gone. It, it's gone. You can't. You can't recover it. So it has to be really letting ourselves get out of the way. And we are about to take another break. And when we come back, we're going to continue talking to Marjorie Roth about spirit and music. If you'd like to call and ask a question, the number is one eight hundred nine three zero two eight one nine. Back in a moment. Chris Stainis is a spiritual leader and healer and teaches a course on how you can transform your life through a meditation and healing system that will manifest your spirit's dreams. She manifested the Women of Wisdom Conference, the Women of Wisdom book, and this radio show. And she can show you how to change your life, too. Are you ready? Visit the website and contact her at VoicesOfWomenToday.com. That's VoicesOfWomenToday.com. The Truth is Funny, Shift Happens with Colette Marie Steffen is excited to welcome Karen Benton as a monthly guest host. Tune in on the third Wednesday of each month at 8 a.m. Pacific time to regain confidence and trust in your capacity to create change in your life, your health, your family, and your well-being. Karen Benton is a mother, nurse practitioner, certified body talk practitioner, Franklin Method instructor, and owner of Limitless Living LLC. For more information about Karen, visit KarenBenton.com. Amber Teal, founder of The Healthy Edge, is bringing you the hit show Healthy Edge Radio, living with power, passion, and purpose. Amber provides the support and tools necessary for you to finally release the weight and emotions that are hidden beneath the weight. Tune in each month on Transformation Talk Radio. For more information on how you can take the next step with Amber, visit GetTheHealthyEdge.com. Tune into the wisdom of your soul for guidance on living a joyful life. On Soul Wisdom Radio, Wendy will provide inspiration to raise your vibration and connect with your higher self and guides. Learn how to balance your ego and to progress spiritually on Soul Wisdom Radio with Wendy Rose Williams. Visit wendyrosewilliams.com or Transformation Talk Radio to learn more about a healing session with Wendy and her events and publications. The Angel Lady dot net. 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 
Sue Storm, theangellady.net. Live your magnificence, for the love of joy is a precious gift offered to us by Robert Schoenfeld, host of the Art of Powerful Living Radio. He takes us on an incredible 30-day adventure to expand our minds and hearts with the nectar of life, love, and joy. This book will help you bring more joy, love, health, abundance, adventure, romance, and magnificence into your life. And we're back on the Psychic Professor Show with Dr. Susan Barnes on Transformation Talk Radio. And we are having a conversation with Dr. Marjorie Roth um, from Nazareth College. And we're talking about music and spirit. Now, how do you introduce some of these ideas or apply it to your students? Yes, well, um, I, as I said earlier, I do have a very good audience here with my students because this is a Nazareth has a very open-minded, interesting group of students that we have. Um, but most of this, most of what I talk about with my students comes in an upper level music history class called Music and Magic. And there's where we study a little bit of Neoplatonism, a little bit of alchemy, a little bit of astrology. Um, I, I do a unit now on spiritualism, largely because of Mrs. Brown, a little Kabbalah, um, all the all the usual, all the nine yards of the esoteric studies kinds of things. And then we look at how composers have used those ideas. And I usually give the students a chance at the end of the year to work out their own project, something that has come to them from the lectures, some interest, uh, particular interest they have in one of the esoteric topics. And I say, just figure out something you might want to do uh, to use this. And one year we had a young woman come in who had not been doing very well in school and nobody really knew why, because she was very smart. And she came to me just before the, the week before the class. And she said, well, I'd like to tell you that one of the reasons I'm, I've been falling behind in grades is because I've been hearing voices and I've been contacted by a particular popular musician who I, I did not know, who was recently departed. And she said, I've been writing songs with him. And I, I can't stop writing these songs, and I feel compelled to do this. And if you don't mind, I'd like my last presentation to be one of these songs. And I thought that was remarkably courageous of her, and I wasn't really sure how the students would take it, but it created a real, a lovely atmosphere in the room. She told them the story. She told them that her family had a history of uh, spiritualism that she didn't know about, until this started to happen to her, and finally her mom said, oh, yes, you're not the first in our family. Um, and she talked it over with her family a little bit, and then she started writing down these songs. And apparently for her, it was quite healing. And for the students, it was a really moving evening that we had together. I was very proud of all of them for the way they, uh, they listened to what she had to say with a very open mind and asked her very good questions about the process. And I thought she answered the process quite well. So that's just one of the things I can think about. But I, I also do notice with my music therapy students, I wonder sometimes what it is they're doing when they show me how they work in clinic or they do things like they do in clinic. To me, it seems remarkably like what we've been talking about here. And now, I, not there's one, one question. Oops. I'm sorry. There's one question you didn't answer, though. How was the girl's music? It was good, actually. It was very good. And it came, it was that kind of music, you know, so she wasn't the greatest singer, she wasn't the greatest guitarist, but that's kind of not the point. You know, that music came from a place that really reached all the other students in the class and, and me also. And I think as musicians, we have all probably had the experience of hearing a technically flawless performance that leaves you absolutely cold. And that gives you the idea that that music is not coming from this place where we all as musicians would like to be, where we feel that we're communicating with something else. And so this young lady's performance was, I would say, rough around the edges, but definitely 
from that internal place, which is where we all want music to come from. Wonderful, wonderful. So now continue, what else do you do with the students? You were talking about the therapy students? Yeah, these are, these, I'm, I'm focusing mostly on the music therapy students here because I think their conception of music is from the very beginning less, less as a fine art, less as a performing art, as it is something that is a, a tool for transformation. They just understand intuitively that this is something that will transform people from an unhealthy state to a healthy state in some way. And they study it in here at Nazareth. Of course, if they if they studied it like alchemy or like astrology, they would never get a job anywhere. We have a very rigorous program here that is certified by the state, and their approach to their to being a music therapist is very scientific and very closely controlled by a fine faculty. So then when they come to my upper level class, it's really the first time where I think they explore the sort of less scientific or less uh, positivistic aspects of what it means to be a music therapist. And they all usually fall madly in love with a, a man from the 14th century named Marsilio Ficino, who was a doctor and used music to heal. He used planetary music to heal people. And they all are very inspired by him. And it, it gives them a chance to look at their very scientific discipline from a slightly different way, something that is a little bit more spiritual and maybe a little, or a little bit more openly spiritually, let me put it that way, a little bit more openly spiritual, and something that allows them to come into contact with the magic of what it is they're doing, um, the magic of what we're all doing as musicians when we make music that moves people in some way, that is transforming them, that is doing something to make the world better. That's a wonderful thought. I mean, uh, I mean, I guess, you know, we have so much music, uh, elevator music and all this music yeah. around in our environment that, yeah, the transformation, how music can transform us as people is a really exciting kind of idea. It's true. And I think we've lost that. I, I think one of the things I, I appreciate so much about my students here, all my students here, is that they come in with that understanding of music, that they're here to study music because they've had some experience with music that has transformed their life or made their life better in some way. So it's moving and nice to work with kids like that. Um, but I think we, in our modern understanding of music, have gotten so focused on the, um, I don't know, the technique of it or the business end of it, you know, the selling of it, um, the popularness of it, the dance music, all that stuff is very nice. But I'm an early music person. And my very famous favorite composer, really, from the early music period is an opera composer who created opera specifically as a way of making human beings better human beings. He didn't have in mind terrific singing and, you know, a wonderful orchestra and stuff. When Claudio Monteverdi first wrote Orfeo, his job, his his goal in that opera was to make us go through a cathartic experience musically with that character and come out the other end having been transformed in the same way that he was. So Monteverdi had in his mind that opera was medicine first and music second, sort of social medicine first and music second. And we've lost that a little bit, I think now. We're very focused on music as terrific performance and I'm, I'm all for terrific performance, as long as we don't forget that other side of it that allows people to maybe perform less well, but still do something that is really moving for other people and for themselves. Yes, I, I mean, that that's very, very true. Um, the idea that, that the music can, can heal us and help move us. And I think that the music therapy courses that you guys are teaching are really, really important for people, because I think that that is a wonderful, wonderful way to heal. And it's also a way of healing that's not using drugs or, or substances or things like that. It's just using sounds. And I, and I have some friends who, who have the gongs, you know, that oh, play yeah. the gongs and do the sound healing through that. And I have had some gong therapy, and it, it really is amazing. It really, the sounds just really help to put me back into balance. So that's what's important with it. 
Yes, and it, it's true. It's not just necessary. We have to, this leads then to what is music? Is music have to be composed music or can it just be a sound? And I know I sit sometimes with a singing bowl and I just play my singing bowl and maybe a half hour goes by and I don't notice the time, but I notice that my breathing is better. My blood pressure, I think, is lower. So is that music or is that just a sound? Does it really matter? You know, any kind of healing sound works for me. And with that, we are just about at the close of our show. This is Dr. Susan Barnes. You've been listening to the Psychic Professor Show, sponsored by the Spirit Art Gallery. And we're going to thank Marjorie Roth for your wonderful discussion of spirit and music. Thank you, Susan. You've been listening to the Psychic Professor Show with Dr. Susan Barnes, the Voices of Spirit Radio. Dr. Barnes' deep knowledge of spiritual issues provides an hour of lively talk and discussion about everything from historical facts to transcommunication. To download this show or any past shows, or to learn more about Dr. Susan and her spirit-inspired art, visit spiritartgallery.net. 